try my best, uh, 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 <laughs> Justice Judge Musaneke. I just had my shot of um, Pfizer, I think, today. Oh, my goodness. So, see, as I'm Good. over the age limit for... <laughs> people who you're, are you're yes so I yes. <laughs> i'm listening to you please and, and i yes, wish you I well am. and i hope it doesn't affect uh, you let me start first with... it is a bit i drink a lot of water that's what they recommended um Wonderful. on the first question about uh, free the freedom of an election you know our position is that how do i make a free choice as a voter a free choice can only be an informed choice. And if we're not able to reach people and explain your manifesto or allow people to criticize you openly with regard to your failures uh, or, your, or praise you with regard to your successes, uh, free choice becomes inhibited. And it's for that reason I'll, I'll marry two um, together Two, of your, uh, two answers, two questions together, is that we're saying and we're recommending that the ANC, uh, we know that we need three months. We know that for the last um, many elections, we, we need three months to reach voters, to persuade them, to talk to them, to help them to understand our manifesto. Um, and it is not the big meetings that count, frankly speaking. You know, the big rally in the, in the stadium is less important than the knock on the door to a person and, and the one-on-one -on -one conversation. That is really enabling people to make a free choice because everybody else will have the same opportunity to do exactly that. So uh, from that point of view, we, um, we know that campaigning is possible under level one and two, uh, even if there are restrictions on gatherings. But level three and four makes elections campaigning impossible because A, there's restriction on movement. Secondly, there's restriction on numbers. Thirdly, there is the fact that both democracy and safety have to be regarded as, as both are important elements in, an, in any election. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so the, the clear three months, is un uninhibited three months, even if it is one and two, under a restriction level one and two, it's less inhibited than three, four, and five. Of course, nothing will move. Um, we, we um, in our submission, will say to you that we do trust the science and the fact that there is a proven kind of um, element of the waves. It comes every six months. You make oh, uh, something is, is more devastating, last deeper. It's for that reason uh, uh, that we are saying there needs to be a review of the timetable of the IEC. Because even though we would like to have elections in, in October the 27th, it will depend on whether or not this wave continues way beyond August. We also know that it is impossible for us to reach the registration date of the 17th and 18th of August already. We, we, we use the word may in our submission many times because we yes. simply don't know. And therefore, the, 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 what I want to say is that after October, that's when it has to be answered. What do we think? The Constitution has limited and our recommendation um, uh, Judge Musaneke, is that we look for an extension after October, if we have to, of between one and six months. And that yeah. would probably take us into a safer period. On vaccinations, and I'll end there, um, it is significant. It is vitally important that there is a significant number of vaccines administered by, the t by hopefully the time you go to uh, an election so that you have herd immunity. Um, uh, and, and we take the, we, I mean, we have to accept that it's, it's slow, but we also know that the government has procured um, a lot of vaccinations which are being rolled out now. 
I think it's under 50s that are going at the moment. Soon it will be under 40s, and then you will be able to go um, judge Musaneke <laughs> when they reach <laughs> that point. But yeah. I, 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 I think vaccination is a critical issue for consideration. We, we do agree with that. Yes, thank you. You see, I have the DG here. Remember, I've been farting and searching all over, as you might have followed or seen or heard. I had the DG of health here before me yesterday. And the DG says to me, no, 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 I will have about 40 people vaccinated, 40 million people vaccinated only around February of next year, thereabouts. And says, on all accounts, I would not have herd immunity even by December, even with the end and rolled out and set out these projections on the basis of their procurement and on the basis of the, what they are doing now, they hope it to go to 120,000 a day and hope to ramp it up one day to 200, 250. And if they're to get there, you can do the sums. It will go well beyond October. So the debate has been, and I'm just putting it, anyway, like to comment or not, the debate has been to try and find the least harmful point. In other words, <clears throat> to push back against extended postponement, one. And um, even parties that earlier had argued for extended postponement did not when they came before me. Everybody seems to have moved more towards uh, between March and May, which comes within the range that you have put up. But on the, on the other hand, that will really depend on the extent to which uh, Dr. Butelezi, the DG of Health, and them actually do what they have to do. Because even if the wave, even if the wave kicks up, say in March, February or March, then the harm to people will be so much more modulated, as we all know. All science, all the scientists who have been before me, four of them, have said then the harm is hospitals won't fill up. Death will be, you know, quite, quite limited. Mortality will drop, as you've seen in the, in the, in the global north. And, and therefore, there'll be a certain measure of normality, the three months, clear three months that you're seeking. So I'm just putting this out, Deputy SG, to say that is the kind of debate. Of course, there are parties that affirm that there's uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen, as you have said, with may, may, may. But even so, we should go ahead. Uh, I've sometimes said, come hell, come high water. Some don't like it when I say that. To say that, um, but the law never contemplates an impossibility. If there's actually an object impossibility, as you say in your presentation, then you know, the court would look at that and would, would want to consider that. So five years, 90 days is, of course, very firm but only firm to extend that it just doesn't, you're not facing an impossibility. Um, I thought I would just make those points in pass. As to, as to political messaging, uh, many parties, particularly those which are rural based and those which as yourselves who, who serve working class, say that they simply cannot be able to talk to their constituency, whether or not you talk about digital communication for a number of reasons that have been mm. set out. And that seems to tie in with, with, with your position. Do you understand it well? Yes, I do. I do. Yeah. Uh, may I respond? Yes, please, uh, please do. Uh, 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 okay. I think, um, you know, one can't argue against uh, Dr. Butelezi's argument because it's an argument based on He's lived reality as a director general and the planning and so on. But if, uh, if herd immunity, 40 million in South Africa is herd, we could achieve herd immunity if we had 40 million, peop um, 40 million uh, people uh, vaccinated in time to achieve their own uh, uh, status. But we still believe that we must do everything we can do um, to try to avoid going into the second half of 2022 so that we are able to at least meet um, 
our constitutional uh, point, even though it will require two thirds majority if, uh, if it's not impossible to do so. Uh, 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 Judge Wasenecker, we cannot issue our message to every South African um, virtually because not everybody is gifted with data and implements. And especially people who earn um, a little money haven't got the money for uh, data that they would require to receive uh, messages from political parties. So our best option is the direct contact op option. And for that reason, we always talk about three months. Uh, messaging is an important element of a free election. Uh, it's, as, it's as important as explaining your, your manifesto is your message um, and vice versa, but uh, it is vitally important. And we live in a country that um, has 13 and more languages. And that's another element that's very important. Reaching the constituency also requires that we do so and allow everybody to understand us in the, in the language that suits them best. So yeah, um, if we could, we would really prefer not to go over the one to six months uh, unless it was absolutely impossible not to. Yes, I get the point. It's a good, other parties have argued also that in any event, uh, when the new budgets kick in, you would like new councillors to be in there. And if you go beyond the time frame you've put, yes. then create, you create some, some difficulty. Lastly, later today, I'm talking to the chairperson of ICASA. A lot of the parties, particularly those serving rural and working class people have been saying the proportionality rule uh, in, in giving out radio space is unfair, it's inequitable. Mm. What does the African National Congress say to that? I know it's a difficult, it's a care ball because you're the beneficiary <laughs> of the proportionality rule. But <clears throat> I've tried not to apply it here. Everybody gets 30 minutes. But um, even if you go to February, March, you're going to need a lot of messaging uh, going out there because infection will still be swelling around and not everybody would have been infected. Shouldn't we be looking at revising the proportionality rule? And, and I wonder what I'll hear what Ikasa says, so that radio stations, community stations, something new for the new normal, so that people can be able to message, even if whether we're doing October, I don't know yet, we'll have to make up my mind, or whether we do, we do March or February, we still need to reform the messaging regime. Uh, and, and that's what I'll be asking Ikasa, whether that is possible. Does the movement have any, any view about that? Well, um, uh, we would, obviously we in the proportionality of the advert space that we, we do get. But uh, the, 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 the issue, uh, Judge Mosineke, is that it's entirely up to ICASA to make recommendations. You know, they, they come with the recommendations and then we, we all agree or we disagree um, about the space that we could get for radio and television. Um, and it, it is important that there is enough space for everyone. And, uh, and we must agree with that, that everyone must be given the space to have that free space on radio. Uh, I don't think TV gives us free space anymore, but on radio and that uh, we should all have some, but it cannot, I think we must also differentiate between equal and uh, what's the other side of equal, e equal equi and- Equitable. 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 Mm. Equitable is, yes. is fair. Yes. It may not be equal, but it should be fair. Yes. Mm. I get that. It, exactly. It, it may not be equal, but it must be fair. Yes. yes. If yes. we can yes. go that route, we would not argue again. I have to ask you to do your closing remarks now, going with my principle that everybody gets equal space. I have to get to my next uh, <laughs> submission. And there is with the, perhaps it's another word, it is with the Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID, the National <clears throat> Committee on COVID. So I'll be hearing what are the prospects, you know, of lockdowns down the road, because that would be quite important. If we're going to have lockdowns anyway, 
until late near October, that would be quite a big consideration, whether or not we have to move out to another place. But if that's my next meeting is with them. But your closing remarks, uh, DSG. Okay, uh, I do very brief, uh, 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 Judge Musaneke, and it's simply to emphasize that democracy and safety are both important to us. Campaigning is possible under level one and two, but um, not under level three, four, and five. We need, we need a clear period to campaign for elections of three months. We'd like to emphasize that. We also want to say to the, to the inquiry that we trust the science, and we also trust that the IEC, we trust the IEC as well, and we're very confident that uh, this uh, inquiry will find a way forward that will suit all of us. Thank you very much, uh, Judge. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time, and I think you should go and rest after the jab. Thank you, DSG. <laughs> Um, Thank you very much. You've honored us. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Are you there? No, it's me, Judge. I was with the DSG. Oh, yo, Minister, are you well? <laughs> I'm yes. just passing my greetings to you, Judge. Thank you. Oh, and Kosika Kulu, you know, I, I said to you before, if I find you in a narrow passage, yeah. I'm certainly <laughs> going to rob you. I'm certainly going to rob you of that beautiful clothing. Yeah. I saw, I saw the suit you had yesterday and I said to my wife, you. Yeah. You, know, <laughs> you should rob much. this man. Or yeah. send me, send me your tailor. It might I help. I will. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Minister. You it take goes. care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank
Dr. Mo, good afternoon to you. Can you hear me? Oh, good Hi. afternoon. Mm. <laughs> to you in yes, we can. Um, I see <clears throat> Professor Silal, am I right? Am I, I hope it's the right pronunciation. Yes, thank you. Yes, thanks. I'm the Khan Seneki on this end. Um, thank you for accepting our invitation. And it's just wonderful to be able to benefit from, from your submissions. I'm not going to spend too much time trying to frame the issue. Um, and there's a specific issue for you, and there's a larger issue for the whole nation, but you're part of the nation also. The, the narrower issue, I mean, the larger issue, of course, relates to whether or not we may properly hold free and fair elections in October. And that arises because there is a fairly blatant and patent collision between the right to life, the right to bodily integrity, the right of access to health care on the one side, and on the other, of course, are the collection of rights that we all know. The right to choose our representatives and therefore to vote. And in circumstances which are free and fair. And therefore the other end would be, if you like, would be democratic. The democratic project versus health entitlements. Um, and that has, of course, I see obviously to pause and say, we're no longer sure whether we actually can hold elections that are free and fair. We're sure we can hold elections, but we're not sure whether we can, they would be free and fair. And needed somebody to second guess that particular question. And that's when I was asked to try and do that. And just to wrap up, you coming right almost at the end of the overall presentation and the written presentations that have come in, uh, and properly so. Um, but, but the whole idea is to get the benefit of, the narrower question is really, where will we be in October? Where are we likely to be in October? And are we looking at a lead level one, a lead level two, a lead level three, four and five, and I accept that <clears throat> you'll disavow the power to decide it alone and exclusively, but we need guidance. If we are going to be <clears throat> there in any event or likely to be there, then it will inform and fit into the crystal ball that I'm invited to um, look into and say something sensible. I'm going to leave it right, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to leave it right there and hand it over to any of you two esteemed scientists. Thanks very much, uh, Chief Justice uh, Mosaneki. I'll take the, the first part of this and then hand over to Sheetal as we go along. And I'd just like to say thank you very much for the opportunity to present an oral submission on behalf of the Ministerial Advisory Committee. Um, I'm not sure that there's really too much more that we can say that you haven't already heard from our esteemed healthcare colleagues this week. I'm sure you've had much data and graphs and things like that thrown at you over the week. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to share a little bit of extra information that, that could possibly assist in the process of, of decision making. Um, I'm just going to share my slide if I may. Yeah. Yes, certainly. Um, okay. Um, I'm hoping everyone can see my presentation there. And I will... I can. Thank you. Great. Okay. I'll just put it on slideshow. There we go. All right. Um, 
Thanks. So, as I say, um, hopefully we won't take up too much of your time. I know it's a Friday afternoon and I'm sure everyone's quite ready to pack up and head off for the weekend. <laughs> so, I just wanted to quickly say a little bit about the Ministerial Advisory Committee on, on, on COVID. Um, it was initially convened in March in 2020 last year. We were appointed by the Minister of Health. Um, it was reconfigured in uh, October 2020 when Prof. Marion Jacobs came in to share the co-chairmanship. Our first chair was Prof. Salem Abdul Karim. And then in April again this year, we had a bit of a reconfiguration and Prof. Uh, Moleka, uh, sorry, Kaleka Milisani joined us. She sends her apologies. She's unable to make it today. But really, the, the MAC is made up of 21 people with varying different skills and expertise. But it's also made up of clinicians who are really at the front line. They are working in the hospitals, in the ICU wards. Um, so we, we get a lot of insight from them about what's happening on the ground. We're a non-statutory advisory body. Um, so what we do is we provide advice and um, information to the National Department of Health, and that includes the Minister of Health, uh, the DG, other people in the Department of Health, as well as the IMT. And so once we've developed an advisory, which is the information that we collect together in response to questions that come usually from the Minister of Health, it then goes out to, to various different bodies all the way up to the National Corona Command Council. And we provide information or, or our advisories on what is the best available evidence at the time. And I'm sure as you'll have heard this week that the evidence changes quite a lot. I mean, sometimes even on a daily basis. And so we're constantly updating our advisories as and when new information becomes available. But I think what's important to note is that we don't have any role in the implementation of plans or in the delivery of services related to COVID. We, we provide advice um, to bodies that do the implementing and, and, and the planning and so on. So I'd like to just quickly uh, take you through the, the process that we went through with the IEC advisory um, and just some of the key points, which I don't think have really changed much since we first submitted um, this advisory in, uh, it was on the 17th of May. And then we had additional questions and we submitted further information. This was now with uh, data from the South African COVID Modeling Consortium. And they do all the, the modeling for us um, in South Africa. And then now we, we, we presenting as an oral submission and there is some new data to present today as well. But I suppose really what our role is, is to determine what the risk is to the public in terms of health. And um, one of the things that we would look at then is, is what are those, what are the activities that would put people at risk? And obviously in an election, there are a number of activities and um, which, which I'm sure everyone's very familiar with, but these would include things like the voter registration weekends, the actual voting process when people go to the polling stations, and that includes transport to and from um, the, the polling stations, any kind of places where people gather in large numbers. So political rallies um, are a, a very high risk event and um, increased person to person contact during door to door campaigning. And, and there are probably other activities that we haven't included. And most notably, I would say, is the, is the um, potential risk of the IEC officials and the support staff, you know, either in the planning and the preparing, as well as when they're actively involved in an election day. So those are some of the risks that we've looked at. But I suppose the question then is, well, these are the potential events what, what is that risk? So if we have these events, what would be the risk? And, and the truth is it's really difficult to say, and I'm, I'm sure it would be wonderful if we could come forward with some concrete uh, predictions and um, projections, but it, it really is so subject to many different factors. And, and these include the behavior of the population and our ability to stick to the NPIs, you know, to masking, social distancing, and so on. 
And we all know that this country is very much subject to COVID fatigue. I think that's probably a lot of what was driving the second wave as well as the third wave. Um, variants, which we will talk about a little bit more, but clearly that is um, a real problem in this third wave and also it was in the second wave. But we also really struggle with information around what is the actual immunity of the population currently? And how many people were really um, infected? And so how many people do have some full or part immunity? And the modelers uh, have tried to include that in their data analysis. And then just another point is that there is still transmission of infection. So people can still become infected and can still transmit the virus in between the waves. And, you know, so it's not like if you can just time it to be at the trough of a wave, then everyone's okay. Um, there is still a risk at that time point. We'll also mention a little bit about the vaccine rollout, but it has been a fairly, um, it was originally a slow and stuttering start. But what we can and what we do know and what the evidence does show is that if you reduce the number of people all gathering together in one place at one time, you can reduce transmission. Um, and we also know from the evidence that if you adhere to the MPIs, um, you can reduce transmission. And that includes things like rigorous contact tracing, you know, making sure people who are COVID positive do go into isolation and don't turn up at the, at the polls. Um, and people who've been exposed actually do go into quarantine for, for the right amount of time. So there are things that we, we can do and we do know. I'm going to quickly take you through some of the slides on data in South Africa. And I'm sure you've seen this. I think we all share the same data because I see these same slides popping up all over the show. Yes, um, I'm happy to take, to take in more. Um, <laughs> hopefully, I'll be better off at the end of it all. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll try and pick out just some of, the, some of the pertinent points or things that I think that are probably um, useful to, to pick out and to know. Yes. And I, I suppose that the first thing is that um, if you look at the second wave, that was driven primarily by the beta variant, the one that originated in South Africa. Yes. And so yes. It, it, it was a much more severe wave, I think, than we'd originally anticipated because of the transmissibility of the beta variant. And, and I do think it, it actually took us a bit by surprise. Um, but, but what is important is that actually not all the waves are the same in provinces. So it doesn't all happen um, you know, in synchronous timing. So it can even differ within provinces, within districts. Um, that waves happen at different times. And you can see now with the third wave, with um, Gauteng, it's just gone through the roof. And so Gauteng is far ahead of the pack, and we know that you know, gradually other provinces are going to be catching up, like the Western Cape and KZN. So we can see them starting to climb the curve. And if you look at South Africa overall, we are looking set to surpass the peak of the second wave. Um, we've got a high test positivity, you know, over th or around 30%, and, and I can't see that it's going to turn anytime too soon. Um, so it's, it, it, currently, we are in a challenging situation, and we are most definitely in the third wave. And, Dr. Moore, uh, just before you, you move away from there, um, would the lockdown impact be seen soon um, or are we just going to shoot up in a straight line as that slide suggests? I think the impact of the lockdown does get seen but it takes time to uh, you know to entrench and I think that the more um, restricted the lockdowns then probably the more likely we are to see some kind of impact. Uh, Sheetal can probably comment on that a bit more. She's our expert modeler. <laughs> Okay, I'll wait till then, and let me not break your presentation. I'll wait when, when, when yeah, when she does come through, then I, 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 could, I could listen to that. Uh, of course, it's important for us, and we'll debate that later. 
we're trying to project the future and know whether we should hold elections or not. So let, let me listen rather, and we can ask the questions later. Okay, super, thanks. Um, so, so just, and I think this is also probably something that's, that's useful to, to kind of bear in mind is that the hospital admissions and deaths follow the cases. So typically it's two to three weeks after you see that increase in cases that you, that you reach that kind of increase in, um, in hospital admissions and deaths. And so you can see in South Africa, the, you know, the first wave was you know, of a certain peak, but the second wave was really more steep and higher. Um, and now it's, it's you know, creeping up for the, for the third wave. But again, it differs between the provinces and, and even within the districts. So if you look at Gauteng, it's, um, you know, we are, we've exceeded the number of hospital admissions and the number of deaths and the number of people in ICU and on ventilators that mm -hmm. we did in, in the second wave. And um, I do think that that is largely driven by the Delta variant. Mm. Um, yeah, so I'm actually going to hand over to Shital now. She can talk a little bit more about the modeling and, and, and probably be able to answer more of your questions around, um, you know, the, the waves and the, the, the way that they work. Thanks. Shital? Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thanks, Jackie. Um, thank you again, um, Chief Justice Mosaneke, for the opportunity to present. I'll, perhaps I'll start with your question because it's directly relevant to what we're discussing now. The impact of the lockdown, um, what in, in re attempting to reduce contacts by, by having these curfews, by having imposing the alcohol bans and the other restrictions, um, working from home, et cetera, we are reducing contacts. This will help to curb transmission right now. And so as uh, Jackie just point out, we will be only really able to see the impact of that or to feel this impact in reduction of cases in a couple of weeks time. Um, but we have to also understand what we'll be able to, to, to see and measure and what actually is impossible to measure. So right now we know that Gauteng is on its increase. By looking at the percentage change in the, and the trajectory of, of um, Gauteng cases, it does look like it's going to be peaking in the next, in the next week, uh, quite likely within the next week. And then it's going to start going, going down while the other, the other provinces are increasing. Now, the... When we start seeing this decrease in, um, in, in transmission by, because of the lockdowns, it might still be looking like an increase overall. So your cases in Gauteng may still be high, though they may be decreasing, but your other eight provinces, maybe not eight, six or so provinces, um, might be increasing as well. So we may still well see an increase in cases, even two to three weeks on. The difference is that had we not had a lockdown, had we not been at this level four, not been able to reduce contacts, we would be seeing a, a larger number of cases. But as a population, we won't feel that because cases are still on the increase. It seems um, that not, there's no impact. So that is the difficulty of, uh, of this kind of action. Yes. But Dr. Silal, uh, before you go ahead, hmm. why two weeks then? So that, so that sort of two-week period, it's, um, it's about the, the lag. Two weeks is just a generalization. It's probably around 10 days. After your cases, it takes a couple of days for the, uh, say, four to six days for your virus to incubate. And then you still, and so you then you develop symptoms and then you, a couple of days for your symptoms to be severe enough in order to seek care at a, a, in hospital. Right. So what, what I was trying to get at is, at least for our purposes, mm -hmm. um, how, how would we know whether after two weeks, we liked to get another two weeks? And let me contextualize that. For instance, we having within five days of the of the two weeks, we have a voter registration. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to have another two weeks, or if you don't know after two weeks, whether there is a downward trend, um, are we likely to see an extension anyway, which then would destroy the plans of trying to have voter registration? I think the one, the, the one thing we can say with certainty is that the, in, in two weeks, 
you, we, we can't be judging the trend in the country as equally applicable to all the provinces. So while in two weeks time, Kauteng might be decreasing, we see that the Northern Cape is on the decrease right now. The free state, which was on the decrease is starting to increase again slowly. Uh, and all the other provinces are increasing. In two weeks time, they are not going to have peaked. So if what you're looking for is a decrease in all the provinces, that's not going to happen in two weeks time. And just because we may start seeing a decrease nationally, it doesn't mean that that's the same across the country. In fact, because of Kauteng being the majority of cases right now, that would primarily apply to Kauteng. Thank you. So with this particular um, slide that, we, that we're looking at now, this, is, this comes from the South African Modeling Consortium uh, of which I'm a part. And we generated these projections in April. They were publicly released on the 29th of April, but they were made much earlier on in April in anticipation of the Easter weekend. You will remember the, uh, the lots of you know, uh, public communication on the part of government around be, you know, beware of uh, large family gatherings and we want to you know, be, be careful where your mask, socially distance, et cetera. We developed a range of scenarios in anticipation of the third wave. So using data like the zero prevalence data that um, uh, Jackie had mentioned earlier and the cases hospitalizations to date from the second wave, we use that to, um, to make projections on what might be anticipated in the third wave. The idea would be that areas that were not um, did not have a high zero prevalence or a high proportion of immunity might experience a worse third wave compared to those areas with a higher level of immunity. But importantly, these projections were made in the absence of an additional variant. So it took the beta variant into account that this was the dominating variant. And by that, we mean it had taken over um, and uh, it was the only variant in circulation. And so we, we made these projections then based on population behavior, because that was the question at the time. What could changes in this behavior, reduction in the response to, to NPIs and population fatigue, what might that have? And so these blue lines that you see here um, are going from April to July, October, and so forth. Those are different sets of projections ranging from a, a fast and strong response to a good response to NPI adherence to one in light blue where it is that of a, a more fatigue. And so when you made those projections, we kept on after April tracking them against hospital admissions as we were recording them. And so what you can see by looking at the uh, at Carl Teng is that you can see from until the beginning and until some point in, um, in, in, in June, the, the, the beginning of June, it tracks this middle scenario very well. Hospital hmm. admissions, we're tracking the scenario, um, this middle scenario. And so our projections on, um, on pop and population behavior and population fatigue as we were seeing it and observing in, in some data seem to be bearing out that there was a reduction in adherence to NPIs and how uh, everybody were, were socially, you know, uh, meeting, con increasing contacts and so forth. But then what you can see straight after that is that in the month of June or so, we see the sudden increase in admissions. And this sudden increase shoots out in a pattern that's really not like the, um, the, the pattern of the projections. It's quite um, extreme and outside the projections. We see something similar in the Western Cape where it was tracking the second um, uh, from, from lighter to blue, the second scenario well for a few months, but in the month of June also suddenly picked up. And so what that says to us is that as much as the, the third wave perhaps started in April, May, because of increased contacts in the community, the Delta yes. variant or some other factor was to, had, to be, uh, had, had to come into play in order to push these admissions out of this pattern. And that is what brings us to the discussion of the Delta variant and what it really means. Mm. But on these tracking projections of the third wave, I know you said that they were really based on the, on, on the previous uh, <coughs> variant. Mm -hmm. um, the expectation was that it would all flatten out by October, is it? Yes, in the absence of another, um, in the absence of another driver. So, so, so the, 
what is happening here uh, is that we are not reaching say a herd immunity threshold where the epidemic will go up it will go down and stay down forever there needs to be there are many different factors that can lead to increases in infection so what our zero prevalence data in the country tells us even the most recent data which uh, the updated version came out this morning um, is that there is around 50% um, immunity in the population at the moment that means there's another 50% of the population yet to be infected still. So even if the, these projections at the time in the absence of the Delta variant showed that the epidemic, the third wave rather, would be over by, by August or September, that is no, there, there is no reason to believe that a fourth wave may not start by October again because they could be, the school holidays could be, could be a driver, uh, warmer, you know, uh, warmer weather or more, more uh, contacts between people could be, could be a, a driver. We could have a, obviously a, a new, another variant, um, even you know, a fourth one after, after this. There are so many other drivers that uh, are part of this virus's evolution and never forget that the population are only getting more and more tired. And so population fatigue and the health system fatigue, both of these start playing a role uh, more and more, uh, more and more so as our waves progress. Yes. And, so, and that is why we monitor cases. We don't just make projections and track them like this. We also monitor the cases um, three times a week uh, in order to see are there little increases happening in small spaces in the country? Um, are they happening in certain provinces and not others in order for us to be able to, in order for us to make an indication of when we should be concerned that cases are on the rise again? Yes. Okay. But, but this is, yeah, as you explained, uh, Doctor, this was, this is, without taking into consideration the new variant, is that it? Yes, that is correct. This is, it hasn't, this, this was before Delta, we even knew about Delta. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Jackie. So bringing us right on to Delta then, if we look at where, where Delta variant is present or has it been detected at the moment. It's in over 85 countries, and that is several uh, in Africa, uh, including ourselves and uh, even our, our neighbors, uh, Namibia, in, in where, the, where we can see, according to this um, graph, there's no formal detection of, uh, of Delta. The, the country itself is also um, in, in a state of, of concern because cases are increasing rapidly and there's no explanation why. So Delta is causing concern all around the world, though actually detected in 85 countries. And when we say it's rapidly becoming dominant in many countries, what we mean to say is that it's rapidly taking over or outcompeting is the is the perhaps the best phrase. It's outcompeting the other variants to become the main mode or the, the main variant that is being transmitted around, the main form uh, and characteristic of COVID that is being transmitted. Thanks, Jackie. Mm. I'm, I'm sure you've seen these plots, but what we have here are perhaps the most uh, well, am among the most updated uh, plots. Because I do not, uh, I think these were only just made publicly available. Sequencing yes. data from the Genomic Surveillance uh, Consortium, um, they are working around the clock and sequencing takes, uh, takes a long time and a lot of resources. And so there is a backlog with trying to sequence as fast, you know, the most recent data and doing it as fast as possible um, yes. and collating this information between the public and private sector. If you look at South Africa as a whole, so taking into account all the provinces, what we can see is that, you know, the, um, we can see that from uh, August all the way really until, um, until November, December or so, we, we, that was when beta became the dominant variant. We had what we would call the wild type, the original COVID, that where our first infection was on the 5th of March. And then uh, this yellow uh, beta variant, um, the V2, came in and it took over and outcompeted the wild type, the wild type uh, infection. Yes. And it stayed dominant and stayed the, the only variant until Delta was detected. Initially, we know Delta was first detected uh, amongst uh, travelers only. Uh, but then, as we heard last week, uh, last week Saturday, that it, it came even as a surprise to the, um, to the genomic surveillance team how quickly Delta had dominated in community transmission. So not just because of travelers, but now uh, circulating in the community. And we see right now that in terms of the genomic samples that have been collected and tested, 
it is currently sitting at 100%. So basically almost all, all or literally all the samples that we are now detecting are from the Delta variant. And this is now the joint um, samples for the country. But because yeah. sampling doesn't occur um, proportionately or even in all the provinces, or there's not a lot of data in all the provinces, uh, we need to look at what's happening in each of the provinces because again, it happens at different speeds. In Kauteng, which is uh, the, the major case that we um, have been speaking about, we see that the the in black here, we've got the daily cases in Kauteng and in, in um, green, you've got Delta. You can see that the patterns are quite similar, that as our cases are increasing, Delta is also increasing. Delta being at a very low level in the months of April and May, but really taking over in the, um, in the la la latter part of May and most of June. So we can see then it, this corroborates with the graph I showed earlier, the plot I showed previously, mm. where we can see that there was some, uh, there definitely was some um, population fatigue uh, and uh, during stay in has increased contacts involved in the start of the epidemic. But del as Delta has become uh, more dominant, we can see that Delta is really the causative um, factor, or the driving factor of the rising cases in Kauteng at the moment. In, in KZN, we also see something similar. We see that the KZN only recently started experiencing a rapid rise in, in cases. Cases are still low. If you look at Kauteng, we're sitting in the 10,000s, but in, um, in, in KZN, we're still sitting on a daily basis at you know, um, 600 cases or so. Um, but they are, on the, they are on the rise. And as we can see, Delta has also taken over or dominated in that province. In the Western Cape, we can see here that Delta hasn't quite achieved 100% of all samples as it has in KZN and Gauteng, but it is also on a sharp rise. We see a, almost here a distinct change in the daily cases where it is slowly increasing until the end of May, and then again, a much sharper or more rapid rise, a steep rise in the month of June, also associated then with the um, growing, growing Delta. And this data, are changing on a daily basis. Uh, and so by the end of the week, it may well be the case that we have 100% of samples uh, reflecting uh, the Delta variant. This is not only the case in South Africa, in the United Kingdom as well, the Delta variant took over or dominated within a matter of weeks. So as we're seeing the month of June for us has been the, the month in which Delta went from not really knowing much about it to becoming the only variant um, in circulation. The same was also true in many parts of the United Kingdom. Now, what we need to recall here is that, you know, we, when we're looking at KZN and Gauteng, these are our two um, biggest provinces in terms of population. Western Cape is also a, 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 at least a, a, a metropolitan hub or a hub of business activity. Uh, but some of our, uh, but our other provinces, Limpopo, Mpumalanga, uh, Northwest, Northern Cape, um, they are still, we don't have a lot of data on the, on the Delta variant in those provinces but they may very well be infected. And that, that is partly, um, that's part of the reasoning for, uh, for national restrictions right now is that we're trying to also protect the spread of Delta into other provinces where it has not yet been detected. But thanks, Jackie. So why is Delta doing this? Why are we seeing this really sharp increase? And it's because of this characteristic of Delta. Delta can take over other variants like beta and, and the wild type because it has an advantage. And that advantage is that it is more transmissible in, in terms of it is easier to transmit the virus from one person to another than it was in the case of beta, than it was in the case of the original COVID, the wild type as we know it. The reason why beta took over so quickly in December, uh, this variant is because beta was also more transmissible. And that was scary enough a situation in December with a more transmissible variant. Now Delta has been measured to be, and our references are down here, Delta has been measured to be 30 to 60% more transmissible than other variants of concern, including beta. So this is the advantage it has over the beta variant, which was itself quite a highly transmissible uh, variant. So this is why this idea of preventing contacts um, is really important. This speaks directly to the um, to the different activities that were mentioned. Um, you know, as part of the election process, the rallying, the transport, the registration. All of these are are contact based activities. 
And so Delta being more transmissible means that it's also easier than before in order to for, for, for this transmission to happen with more of these contact-based activities. If you were to compare Delta to the original COVID, the wild type, um, back at which we were familiar with uh, in March to July or September last year, Delta is approximately two times as transmissible. Now, one way to think about this, um, it is a, it's a proxy, but one way to think about this is that I mentioned earlier, our best estimates are that half the population are immune right now, but we have a variant that is twice as transmissible. That puts us almost in the same position that we were at the start of COVID in March last year when nobody was immune and the virus was uh, one times as transmissible. So now we've got half the population immune, but the virus is twice as transmissible. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, that's scary, uh, but another way to, to, to look at it. But Dr. Silal, I mean, does that mean the 50% um, immunity that we have w would render those people also susceptible to a Delta infection? Partially. Um, and I'll get to that in the, in, I think it would be the okay, next, that's fine. next slide. Yeah, Do it that's when it's convenient. Okay, that's fine. Thanks. Um, so the, in terms of protection or who might be protected, there are two ways we can be protected. So uh, leading directly from your question, having prior infection that 50% of the population who have previously been infected have some degree of protection. And I'll speak about that a little later. But the other way to protect the population is through vaccination, as we, as we know it. In our country, you know that we are vaccinating uh, primarily with Pfizer, but we also have uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccines that um, the data from the Sisonke trial came out today, and I think another paper as well came out today showing good uh, protective immunity against the Delta, uh, protective efficacy against the Delta variant. To discuss the results of the protection offered in terms of the Pfizer uh, vaccine, the first, um, this is based on UK data, and the um, first, uh, first table is in terms of protection against symptomatic disease. So whether you're, so you have mild symptoms, just you know, a runny nose, a mild cough, or you have more severe infection, you group it all together into symptomatic disease. Mm. So with um, Pfizer, if you had one dose, there is a 33% effectiveness against symptomatic uh, disease, a 33% level of protection. But if one was vaccinated with two doses, as perhaps very few of our um, uh, 60 plus uh, citizens might be having received a second doses from this week, um, then you have very good protection uh, against all symptomatic uh, disease. So against mild and severe infection, 88%. One of the key indicators, and really I think perhaps the greatest benefit of vaccination though, is that it is um, its efficacy against protecting you from a severe illness, severe illness, severe enough, severe and critical illness that is bad enough to warrant hospitalization. And so uh, with respect to Pfizer, we can see here that even with one dose, the Pfizer vaccine has been shown to be 94% effective against severe illness, against hospitalization. And with two doses, it's really pretty much the same, 96% uh, effective. And so what that is saying to us is that even our population who have received one dose of Pfizer so far are have a very, very high protection from the, de from the Delta uh, variant that should they be infected, that they won't be uh, hospitalized. So that's the, uh, that's the uh, protection offered against severe infection. So if we look at a summary, and this is where I'll talk about reinfection uh, as well, the Delta variant is more transmissible than all the other variants currently in circulation, uh, not even in the country, but also in uh, around the world. There are other variants, um, uh, some had first been detected in South America, others in, in Nigeria, the ETA variant we might've heard, it's another African um, uh, first, a, a variant first detected in Africa. Um, we also had, there's another variant detected in Mauritius. So there are a couple of, there are quite a few variants of concern right now, but the Delta variant is more transmissible than all of them. There's no, 
clear evidence yet that it has a different uh, severe pro severe profile or it's more severe than the beta variant or the original uh, the original wild type variant. We don't have evidence yet. As we can see, Delta has taken over in a couple of weeks in the United Kingdom and a couple of weeks um, in South Africa. So the uh, speed at which this data can be collected on admissions and so forth that is, um, uh, it's probably still to come only in the next couple of weeks. So we have no information on severity yet. We've just seen with the vaccines that there's no evidence of vaccine escape, that our vaccines are still offering quite very high levels of protection against severe disease and hospitalization. With respect to risk of reinfection, now that 50% of the population, they do have some protection. However, with the, um, what has been shown in a lab setting and communicated in uh, last week's press conference by the genomic surveillance team is that there is a reduction in the ability of those who have been infected with the beta variant. So in our second wave, those infected in the second wave have a reduced ability to neutralize the Delta variant or to provide protection against the Delta variant. How this is going to play out in the population, because those are lab results right now, we are yet to see. And so there's ongoing analysis being done in the NICD at the moment, but there's no indication. The Delta variant is still so new in our country that there's no indication yet of um, the number of reinfections uh, with, um, in those of the population who have been previously infected with beta. So those infected, uh, and we had, of course, um, quite a, a larger number of infections um, in, the in the second wave compared to the first, but those infected with beta may have a reduced ability to fight off the, the Delta variant and may, have re may become reinfected. Um, thanks, uh, Jackie. So I think this is my uh, uh, last uh, slide before I hand over to Jackie again. As part of the modeling consortium, um, what we are currently doing, and I'm sorry that the uh, our oral submission here is uh, perhaps uh, one week too early for, um, for for the contribution from the modeling consortium. We're given the speed at which things are happening. We're currently adapting those projections I showed you earlier to incorporate Delta to see what Delta might uh, be. Um, how, how the epidemic might be progressing over the next couple of months uh, in order to offer some kind of long-term uh, projection. We're working on that, or if I may say colloquially, I am working on that this weekend in order to uh, make a presentation to the Department of Health and the uh, National Corona, uh, Corona um, Command Council next week, Tuesday. So that is um, and that plan at the moment, but we do not have uh, this information to be shared right now. What we are doing, though, is through a range of scenarios um, on the Delta variant, coupled with the fatigue that uh, we know is abound in the population, we will be uh, making, providing these estimates on the duration of the epidemic and its impact on hospitalizations and deaths. I and think those three, doc, Dr. Will, no, those no, are no. the same scenarios that you have already done in relation to beta mm -hmm. variant, mm -hmm. is that it? Um, sorry, I, I, don't, I, I didn't understand I the say, question. I, I just wanted to, to get it clear in my own mind that the work you'll be doing over this weekend and thereafter Mm -hmm. would produce the same scenarios as you did, or comparable scenarios as you did in relation to the beta variant. Is that yes. it? Yes, uh, it, it would be comparable. It may be, uh, slight, uh, it, it may be different just depending on the questions that are required to be, to be answered. Okay, um, and what are chances of, uh, of having a, a sneak preview? I'm writing a report within within the next two weeks, the next 14 days or so. But your scenario changes so often. <laughs> I need to have a sense of what would be the behavior of Delta mm -hmm. um, by, the, by October. OK, so what I think um, I will be able to do is that we will uh, we're going to most likely have something to to share with the uh, minister minister of health um, and the DG and NCCC next week, um, and so uh, straight after that we should be able to share. Um, apologies, I have a very loud cat. <laughs> <laughs> straight after like that, it. we'd be able to share these scenarios with you. So I can uh, most likely get something to you next week. Would that be okay? 
that will be wonderful. That will be most, most kind. Yes, because that will really help me having had this. Mm. And uh, it, it might be a, a phone call or something that might yes. resolve uh, what is there for you to explain it to me or something, or a little uh, a, a Zoom, short yes. Zoom meeting. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. That will be fine. Mm -hmm. um, Jackie, I think over to you. Thanks. Um, not much more that we have, um, but just quickly to talk about the vaccination program at South Africa, because I know that's one of the questions we do get asked is, well, if we've managed to vaccinate people, um, you know, would we have sufficient herd immunity by October? And I think, as you can see, the, the vaccination program had a bit of a slow start and it's really picking up pace now. But I think as of yesterday, we would vaccinated around 3.15 million people. Of the total <coughs> eligible population, that's about 8% so far. So I think that you know, even with the best will in the world, even if we caught up to what the plans are for the vaccination program, we still wouldn't have enough people vaccinated by October. Um, you know, the, the Department of Health plan is to have, um, is to start vaccinating the 18 plus to sort of 18 to 40 year olds, just starting at the beginning of October, or the middle of October. So they wouldn't have, um, you know, received sufficient um, immunity by then. And, and I think the way it's looking is it's, it's probably going to take a bit longer than that. Doctor, if we, if we, the, the DG yesterday hmm. was saying that the current projections, but you're probably going to deal with that. Sorry, let me not get ahead of myself. Please proceed. Yeah, so I mean, I'm actually not going to talk any more about the projections around the vaccination. So if you if you want to um, ask about that, oh yeah, he he was saying that we probably will be there around February, and that we probably would have had about 40 million people vaccinated by then, um, and and therefore. Uh, October, certainly not. He agrees with you, but thinks that we might have done much more around February, March of next year. Do you have any forecast? Um, not any forecast, except that that is what the plan is. Um, so at the moment, we are a bit behind the plan. So if you look at the, oh, sorry, there we go. Um, the plan is that we'll start vaccinating the 18 to the 40 year olds in October, and that will go on until the end of February. Um, and, but then we'll have this kind of mop up campaign. So what we're already seeing is that the healthcare workers who didn't get vaccinated, um, or certainly not as many as anticipated, the over 60 year olds are not registering as quickly as anticipated. And, and so we'll probably see that in all the populations. So there's going to be a chunk of people who should have been vaccinated, but who haven't yet. And you know, then there'll be more and more efforts to try and bring them in for vaccination. But March to May, what, what, what number does the plan have or project? On the slide, um, look at the slide, I can't see actual numbers. No, no, there aren't actual numbers. The percentage of population or, you know? So, so in order to achieve herd immunity, um, I think the, the number of people who have to be vaccinated is around 67%. Yes. And um, so I, I haven't, we haven't done any projections around this yet, um, but it's, it's very unlikely that by the 1st of March, we will have, have vaccinated 67% of the population. Um, I think that, that we will have fallen short of that. That's purely my um, opinion and speculation. It's not based on any you know, forward projections, um, okay. but, but looking at the pace at which it's going at the moment. Um, I certainly don't think we will have reached herd immunity by the end of February. And, and she told, uh, perhaps you, you've looked at this in more detail with the modeling, but. Forthcoming, not, uh, not, not quite. I think so much of it is dependent on the supply. 
you know, that we, uh, and because that keeps changing, and then with the agreements between the different uh, providers, um, as, as well as with, with variants, um, as you can see now, initially with the beta variant, we had to forego the AstraZeneca uh, supply that had come through because it was not effective against the beta variant. But now we see with the slides, the slides previously that the AstraZeneca is now effective against Delta. So it would not have been of use uh, a few months back, but now it may be a vaccine that might be worth considering because it's effective against Delta. But in March, will our risk to life and limb be less than it would be in October? Is that known? Is that something on which the two um, of you would want to, to comment? I think the, the, the one, I think the comment that I could make is that if we look at the speed at which variants are developing, um, you know, we've, we've never really had a period of no infection. That period between waves has been marked uh, by about, you know, a, a couple of thousand of ca thousand cases a day occurring in different parts of the, uh, of the population. So if the third wave is uh, likely to be, to be over by the end of August, September, we may still have a few months of, uh, you know, one or two to three months of low, low numbers of cases nationally to a, a few thousands. And then it may well be the case that another variant would happen. And this is going to continually happen until we have reached this herd immunity threshold where we have the sufficient buildup of protection. So these waves, they, they, uh, by the time we hit March, we may have already come through a fourth wave, um, which means, you know, the, I think the point is, would we be in the same position in March as we are in October? We may be in a better position because we would have vaccinated more people and, you know, even one more vaccine is, uh, is you know, one little bit of extra protection, as well as having gone through the third wave we, and, and most likely a fourth wave, by then, we will have had a greater buildup of um, natural immunity. Thank you. <coughs> that does clarify the issue. Thank you. I think just quickly to say that, particularly with the Delta variants, in the general population, if they've been vaccinated, the risk is low of, of contracting COVID. If it's a partially or unvaccinated population, it's high. And it's, it's even more... Um, high in the vulnerable population. So that's people, you know, the elderly, people with comorbidities, people who are obese. So um, with, the, with the vaccination, uh, then the, the risk definitely is much lower. And so by March next year, we will have vaccinated a lot more people than we would have vaccinated by October. Um, but to Sheetal's point, who knows whether there's another variant? I mean, I think that they, they seem to be taking us by surprise. They're, they're, they're sneaky. Um, so, so just to say that I think it's, it's, it's as Sheetala said, it's, it's with, we would love to have a crystal ball, but we don't. We just have modelers who work incredibly hard <laughs> days, nights, and weekends. Um, it's, it's really not possible to predict what the pandemic will look like in October um, you know, in South Africa, let alone in provinces or in districts. It's well, let me ask another question, please, may I just, more, which is this. Um, if we're to have a new pandemic, say in February, March, or a fourth wave, would, it, would the variant be of a kind that would be unresponsive? or resistant to the current vaccines? It's By that I mean, would, would we have to go and look for, go, go to ground zero and find an entirely new vaccine? I, so I think it's rather the way to think about it is that every time there's a new variant, the vaccinologists have to do have to look at their vaccines and study where in the virus the you know the, these new variants are the, their location sort of where they're sitting and to see whether their vaccines will actually be able to neutralize the new variant and if they're not they make adjustments that is how with the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines and so forth they have been able to make adjustments as these new variants have been uh, been ar arising we do not know what the we we, we cannot know when a new variant will emerge. These are, these are quite random processes. And we also cannot know what its characteristics will be. 
if a new variant comes in and it takes over, if it, it needs to have some <coughs> feature, it needs to be more transmissible in order to out. It's a, it's a race basically. So it needs to be able yeah. to outrun its competing competing variants. And I mean, I think the case of AstraZeneca is uh, one that is an example to go by that when the beta variant um, emerged, AstraZeneca was in our trials in South Africa were found to have no impact on reducing, on, on protection against beta. But, and yet it has a, a very high impact on protection against Delta. So it very much, the characteristic, the um, genomic characteristic, I think of each, um, uh, of each uh, uh, variant is different and will need to be analyzed every time a variant arises. At Thank least you. in South Africa, we have a good team who's, who's on this. And so we can have up-to-date information. Thank you. That's, that's incredibly helpful. Thank you. You were um, at another slide, key messages, and I interrupted. <laughs> it's fine. I think we really just, uh, we've discussed most of this. Um, you know, we've talked about the Delta variant and, and the, va the fact that we won't have reached sufficient vaccine coverage by October. But I think maybe just to kind of emphasize once again, the, the fact is that if you have any event, regardless of whether it's you know, an election or it's a music concert, large numbers of people gathering in one place at one time is more risky. And um, you know, we do have COVID protocols, but the reality is people don't always adhere to COVID protocols and particularly in big groups of people it's really hard to, to manage them and to monitor them and to make sure that everybody is doing the same thing. Um, and, you know, you're really only as good as your weakest link. So if there are people who are not wearing masks and they are COVID positive in that gathering, you just have a much greater risk um, of, of infection and transmission. So, I mean, from a public health perspective, obviously we want to vaccinate people as quickly as possible. But in the meantime, we want to make sure that we you know, do whatever it takes to significantly reduce the numbers of people. And so from the perspective of looking at the elections, you know, I mean, far be it from us to say that, you know, I don't know, one should spread out the election weekends or, but really I suppose the message from us is whatever it takes to reduce those numbers, that's, that's really where you most likely to, you know, to reduce the incidence of, of transmission until we've reached a point where we do have sufficient herd immunity. But I think if you look at what's happening in you know, countries all around the world, in Europe, in the UK, they've reached high percentages of um, vaccination, yet they are seeing increases in cases. Now, perhaps it might be that those increases in cases don't translate into the same kinds of increases in hospitalizations and deaths, um, but certainly, it's those those risk factors still hold. Yes. So I think except, that's yeah. Except that people would be a little more safer, or the consequences will be a little gentler. Uh, I should say. Absolutely. Um, yes. Well, that's the last. One. Before you go, I'm sorry, Dr. Star, I just want to make one, one point, if that's possible. Um, that I don't think was uh, we we had highlighted. And I think it's I think it's important to under to to take the the consequence uh, into account as well. That by October we've largely would have vaccinated um, the maybe the fifty uh, fifty and so and some of the 40, 40 pluses as well by then. And knowing some parts of the population will still rem remain even in those age groups unvaccinated. The burden on hospitalizations uh, should be taken taken into account as well. That the greatest um, that the 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 voting poll, you know, the the or the largest um, section of the population are so your sort of thirty five to fifty nine year olds. They're a they're a, a very big portion of the voter of the voter population, and they're also a very characteristic population in COVID. That while they may not have the highest risk of death or the highest risk of severe infection, they are the largest number of admissions in hospitals, the 35 to 59 age group. So they oh, comprise really? most of people in hospital. Yes. And so if large portions of that group are not um, vaccinated, our elderly may well be 
quite um, quite protected from having been vaccinated, um, and they may not be the ones ending up in hospital. The unvaccinated may be from that large a voter poll, who would vote a group, who would also be the group attending rallies um, and um, and so forth, and, and sort of the, the precursor uh, to um, to the election, those kinds of events, um, and participating in high contact activities. And so we maybe, as we see now, the the uh, you know com com uh, completely awful situation in hospitals at the moment, with capacity being breached and so forth, we may be going for the same thing as a result um, in in, Oc in October because of this population having this uh, occupying the largest um, group of admissions in hospital. Well, Dr. Silal, when we when when you give me the update last time, it might help if you gave me. The one pager or a slide that speaks mm -hmm. to the <clears throat> the age profile of of hospitalization, the one of 35 to 59. Yeah, okay. that might be helpful. Yeah, if you could give me that, that would fit into. Look, moving towards the end, I'm going to be talking now to people who are not doctors and or health scientists um, or scientists at all. Um, I'll be talking to Ikasa, the broadcasters, but. What I wanted to say as, as, a, as, as a way of a parting, parting remarks is that we're wrestling, you all know, and you South Africans, we're wrestling really with whether to hold our elections. It has reduced itself to that, really. Holding our elections in October as scheduled or taking measures to make it possible to hold the elections maybe a few months thereafter. Um, and I've, I've often used the term sweet sport and, and some scientists have said there's no such sweet sport. In other words, um, by that I mean a sport, a time when, when you call out the electorate, you'll have the least harm. Because naturally, as a judge, my instinct, and of course you judge at that, my instinct is them. It's a threat to life. It's a threat to well-being. It's a threat to access to, to health care on the one side. And we have to preserve our democracy. Um, many who submit on the one end, of course, are very strident about democratic practice and imperatives. And the other on the other side say, oh, we don't want to die. Please help us, protect us defer it so that we can, we can survive. That is the competition. And I'm putting to you, you are scientists, and I don't say that you should commit in any way, but that's what we're trying to get data and science to help us work out. So we want to use science to work out probabilities so that when we do call out people, I would be horrified if we had super spreader events and from October onwards, the, you know, the numbers look as bad as you showed me today with the beta variant, I would feel near dead guilty. But on the other hand, if in fact we go to February, March, and there is no real difference, it will just be as horrific. Um, I leave you with that and you may or may not want to make closing remarks around my conundrum or the nation's conundrum. Thanks. I mean, if, if I'll just make a, a last comment, and I, and I think that it is it is a real conundrum. It really is, and I think it's something that um, you know a lot of people have had to face, not in quite the same magnitude as as what you are facing. In, in terms of trying to predict or trying to estimate what that risk is going to be. I think even the decision making of the president in putting the country into lockdown um, is, is along those lines. And, and the fact is it's actually really difficult to know. But if I were to um, offer a, a, just a, <laughs> a thought around this, I would say that in March, we will be more protected we will have vaccinated more people. Um, and so I think from that perspective, even if there is another variant that potentially does escape from the vaccine and um, is, the vaccines are not as effective, 
we will still have people with some protection. And, and so I think that if you were to say, should we do it in October or March, I would say from a health perspective, public health perspective, March is a better bet. But that's my personal opinion and not that of the Ministerial Advisory Committee. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's from a scientist, and, and that's, for me, it's sufficient. Uh, and I understand you're not trying to make decisions for anybody else. Um, um, it's, it's a lot of, of guests. Where I work usually with guests far less than this. But at the same time, there's a lot of solid, solid science that you have placed um, in our hands, and we, we, understand, we understand a lot of it, um, at least at a high level. And it should be helpful. I, mean, I thank both of you. I don't know if your colleague would like to make any further admission, but I'd, I'd like to thank both of you for this. It's hugely helpful. And certainly, um, I know that I will hear a little more from Dr. Silal about one or two things that I'd ask for, and um, we'll be able to use that. Uh, it's, it's an open process, but it's, it's one where it's riddled with a lot of difficulty. Thank you for your time and for the opportunity to present this afternoon. Yes, thank you. I'll be in touch you well. Sure, please good do. Time. Yes, you have a good weekend and you have a little baby that you've got to deal with, Doctor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. Somebody's demanding attention there. I saw it and yes, so you yes. I give it now. Give it. <laughs> yes. Okay, then. you take care. You too. So, thank you. Thank you. Have a lovely Bye. weekend for both you of you. I'm grateful.
what both are on. <clears throat> A good afternoon to you, uh, Chairperson. Oh, you are here. Yeah. Right, so, oh, didn't they say virtually? No, they didn't say that. No, they oh, they did not. No, I get one. I get one. I get one. I get one. <clears throat> on, I thought it was virtual. I've had just too many virtual meetings to be here. They've got you on camera. So I thought you are right there. Oh, yeah. No, you are most, most welcome. Dr. Kiabetsi, um, may you introduce your colleague when you start making your presentations. Uh, I have been favored <clears throat> with your written submissions, for which I'm grateful. And, um, and therefore, I am more than ready to listen. I must apologize for the short notice we sent you. But this came out. Um, and I'm therefore grateful for you being agreeable to come on such short notice, both of you. And that's what leadership sometimes imposes on us to be responsive. Um, and we should all welcome you. In fact, you are the last, you're going to have the last word in the oral submissions. We are at the end of a long week of submissions. The issue is as I've tried to outline, I've tried to outline in, in, in my letter to you, essentially I've been asked under some legal provision to look into the crystal ball and to try and assess whether we are likely to have free and fair elections as prescribed by constitution and law. Um, and that, of course, has obvious, it's, it's started by the fact that there is an obvious conflict that has arisen on account of the pandemic. There's a, on the one end, of course, would be a collection of very important rights, similar like a right to, to life, right to bodily integrity, and right of access to health care. When hospitals are full, and you can't have health care, it is quite a challenge. So all those rights belong together. Right to life, right to bodily integrity, um, and right to access health care if you were to be disabled or ill. And on the other hand, is a collection, another collection of important rights that are related to our democratic project. These have lived side by side comfortably for long, relatively comfortably until pandemic came. And suddenly <clears throat> there was a real challenge whether the elections could be free or fair, given the limitations that have come into play. And <clears throat> in the course of the discussion, political messaging became prominent. <laughs> Um, how do we then continue to message in effective ways? And this was one of the more obvious things that were raised. Not only now, if we were to go to elections in October, but also true if we were to defer the elections for a few months, the messaging question will still be quite sharp. 
So, let me, let me just leave it right there, Doctor, and invite you, Chairperson, to, you know, to elucidate the submissions we've made in writing and to add whatever might be helpful to the assignment that I have. Uh, uh, meetings uh, once again. Outside of the public broadcast, outside of the SEC, we may have an interest to carry PEPs, we do not restrict them. But the, the, the legislation the obligation rests with the public broadcaster. Now, we, we, we then took note, uh, Justice Moseneke, of the Concord judgment that came uh, you know, some time, I think last year, if I'm not mistaken, uh, about the role of independent candidates. In as far as it relates to elections. We, we applied ourselves uh, very, very uh, deep on that matter, taking into account that the Electoral Act hasn't been amended yet to accommodate the spirit of the Concord Judgment. The, the, the ECA and all other you know, relevant pieces of legislation that CASA and ascribes to are not yet amended. However, we realized that we need to be proactive as a constitutional entity. To, to try and accommodate the spirit of what the Concord judgment was against. And as a result, this would be the first time that we allocate PEPs to independent candidates as well. <coughs> now, we, 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 we understand the role of this uh, inquiry or commission, and in line with our written submissions, to be you know, guided by the the curiosity to learn whether under, under this ravaging pandemic we can, in the best way possible, hold elections. Um, so so, so we, 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 we allocate slots for the PEPs, as I've indicated, using uh, the, the, the principle or, you know, of equitability. And we then, you know, employ a proportional means as a tool to effect or to arrive at the principle. It, it, it's, it's often a bone of contention, but the, the objective reality is that, as an example, 
even in the national assembly, when debates take place, uh, political parties are allocated time based on you know, one of the formulas employed is the number of seats they hold. Uh, the law is very clear, the section that I've referred to CA, that it has to be an equitable process, not necessarily an equal process. <coughs> now, in us allocating PPPs, we have what is called a basic allocation. So with a basic allocation, it means each and every political party, and in this regard, independent candidate, under the basic allocation uh, you know, component, will receive some slots. But then we move on to another criteria further over and above the basic allocation, which then you know, factors in the principle of, of proportional representation. And now we allocate those slots. And then after allocating those slots, we employ an elections monitoring team. Under normal circumstances. Before you move away from <coughs> allocation to monitoring, um, at a practical level, how does it happen? Who does what to identify? I mean, who within the authority, obviously? Who does what? Who doesn't actually matter? But how do you allocate the basic slot? Which I assume a slot, you mean a time before the public broadcaster. How, how do you make sure that everybody gets a slot before you move to the second stage of proportionality? Thank you very much yeah, mm -hmm. for that question. So, so prior to allocation, we work very closely with the IEC. It mm -hmm. will give us a list, a final vetted list of participants. Uh, and, and also that's where the work of this inquiry becomes relevant. Mm -hmm. Because uh, we then <coughs> call all political parties, we set a date, they are all represented, uh, we converge in a hall or in a room, a conference center, and we have you know, small pieces of paper like a raffle form. The PEBs will be allocated, each PEB is about 50 seconds long. We know the list of each and every participant. So as a result, now let us start. We, all of us in this room, we are participating. Uh, the Moseneke political party, get your, your, your piece of paper, mm. your physical piece of paper, which then becomes an issue under the current you know, uh, converging uh, limitations of, of number of people who can converge at the time. So we, we first allocate the basic in that manner. So everyone in the room will definitely receive something. Uh, informed by the list that we have received from the IEC. Uh, and then and every party will get one <clears throat> ballot or, or, or raffle paper. Yes, under the basic allocation. Yes. But this, this year, as I've said, we need to be by this. Because of the Concord judgment, we then made provision for the allocation to, to independent. Sure. So we thought under, under, under the, the basic allocation for this time, we will then you know, approach it with about 60% allocation to independent candidates. Because as we go further under the proportional uh, category, the independent will not be catered. So under the basic, we then give a bit of a wider you know, uh, leniency towards, towards uh, independent candidates. Mm. Uh, now, as I've said, the TEB will be 50 seconds long, uh, excluding the disclaimers. You know, and then, we also operate on the basis of our performance period. Uh, so just to place it on record, uh, there are no PEDs that play in the dark of the night when people are asking. Uh, there's, there's nothing to the effect. PEDs, our performance period is from 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. So clearly you were listening to our streaming chairperson. It's, 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 just this was like, it's a concern that comes from the time. Uh, yeah. Even in the absence of the, the Senate inquiry, mm -hmm. it will come up on the day that we allocate slots. So it's, it's almost a given that before we give out, you know, each out those slots, we hold a mini conference for an hour with various political parties debating a, a, a process which they were invited to partake in. 
Yes, we make our recreation. And you allocate the time 24, over 24 hours. And so from 5 a.m., we call it the performance period, from yes. 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. Mm -hmm. We also avoid that situation where others will then you know, cry foul, which, which I would agree with. If, if others' lots are then located around 3 a.m. and others are paid you know, during the time time. So, 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 <laughs> 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 no, okay. no, 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 you can also view it as a call center environment, more like a call center setup. Setting where we employ about say 60 you know, temporary staff a month before elections until a month after elections. Once we have allocated PEBs, they now need to monitor that these PEBs are broadcasted in a manner that is fair and transparent. Now, one of the questions that this inquiry is to is to say how will this monitoring happen or take place uh, if for instance we go on as we have already started by the way we have identified that waiting space and everything but what would then be the case if one or two election or of the, our election monitoring staff members you know contract the COVID-19 uh, it means overnight we need to quarantine we need to stop now will they be able to work virtually the following day? And if so, how are we going to monitor? Uh, you know, how are we going to supervise, rather, their performance as election and monitoring personnel? It becomes a very, very critical point that we need to look at because the report of the, election, of the elections monitoring team is then submitted to, to the IEC, uh, you know, once elections are being conducted. This is also in the spirit of ensuring that if we said at five minutes past six in the evening, you will be uh, playing a, 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 you know, a PEB of political party A. And then they decide on their own to twist it because it's declared as prime sport and they then choose to play. That's why our election monitoring personnel need to make sure that everything that is broadcast across all the allocated uh, SEC platforms. Now, there's a question. Just the platforms for my own edification, <coughs> Doctor, would include, <coughs> this would include radio. Yes. And to what would be the, the, do the platforms include television? Yes, uh, they do, just I guess, mm. like SEC one and two. I see. Yes. My next question also, and to talk a little, uh, to just to go ahead. Chairperson, the what is the, you said fifty seconds? Uh, help us understand the magic in fifty seconds. That is just under a minute. Yeah. Yes. So, so how it works? Uh, uh, but it's fifty seconds, excluding uh, excluding the disclaimers. So after each and every PDP, there will be a, you know a disclaimer that these views are not of the SABC, that the views of the political views. Sure. So the 50 sure. seconds is to, you know, yeah, is what we allocate uh, for, 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 for that. Because in any event, even the PAs, the ones that are paid for, are usually between 20 to 40 seconds long. I see. Uh, and, and I think we need to also, in the spirit of objectivity, acknowledge the fact that PEBs have a direct impact to some extent in the commercial viability of the cities. I think, much as as ICASA, we enforce it on the <coughs> of on, based on what the law dictates. Uh, now, we should also ask ourselves, if PEBs are to be increased uh, by virtue of us running elections under, under you know, a, a, especially a hard lockdown period, if I can put it, where mm -hmm. no two laws are not uh, done uh, in a good manner, are we now not placing even a more onerous burden on the public broadcaster. Because these PEBs, it means they take, as we speak right now, there are no PEBs playing. So it means these PEBs, once they are introduced during the election period, 
they take space or a spot which ordinarily they've been paid for. So they've been an advert of a particular broadcast, a commercial, commercial you know, company or organization. So the, the public broadcaster then has to accommodate uh, you know, the election period. Uh, Chairperson, again, I've seen in your, in your written submission that the IC has to elect the election period, usually over how long, how long before the elections uh, is the election period. Uh, Just historically, to give me an idea, <clears throat> so, so, would, it be two, would it be four weeks, would it be six weeks, would it be two weeks? Yes, so, so, so I think the best way, to, the more technical way to this point is to say, uh, once the elections, the election date is declared and the IEC then submits a final list to ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to that stage, there is no TDP that can play and there sure. is no allocation of slots that, sure. that would happen. Uh, uh, so, so, so that is what in the main guides uh, our, our interpretation of the, of the election period. Once we have the list and, uh, uh, you know, as we advance towards, towards and even when we allocate PEBs, we then may, we announce officially that the election, the PEBs will start playing from this day to, uh, you know, to, 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 to that day. We, we, are, we announce the exact date. Yeah, yeah but ordinarily, how, how long would it take from the point the IEC finishes the authority with the list of participants? Whether party linked or independent, yeah. How, how long would it? Are we talking of a month? Are we talking of six weeks or eight weeks? Yeah, yeah. I would say just just a number of hours, two to three weeks. I think if I were to use the twenty nineteen example, six to eight. Yeah, around six to eight. Weeks. Six to eight weeks. But in, in certain instances, the IEC is constrained, I guess, due to their own problems. Of yeah, <clears throat> and we happen to get the we happen to get the list a little bit, you know. Uh, late, uh, later in the day. Yeah, I see. Okay, no, okay. Right. So, 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 in the submission we made, we then said, you know, our our posture as it has uh, is that we, we just we are here to, to to communicate our willingness to support whichever decision is made, in as far as whether elections are proceeding or elections are postponed. I think that one. We can place it on that. Mm. However, I have illustrated, and we have collectively, you know, in the in the submission before before Justice Masenege, we have mm. illustrated the challenges which are at play. Yes, I've said with election monitors and so forth. Now, we said if a decision is made that elections will proceed under the current uh, LG, what we may try to do is to use our ICT uh, disaster management regulations, which are CASA regulations. We have previously used these regulations for you know, relaxations on the approval, quality type approval of equipment. We have used those regulations for the temporary assignment of a radio frequency spectra. We have used those regulations for the relaxation in the broadcasting side, relaxation of uh, local content of so we will try to use those obligations, those regulations to engage. But it's, you know, it's a, it's a function of consultation. To try and engage commercial and other community broadcasters to see if they will be willing to also, you know, uh, agree to carry PPPs. Meaning that's the only reasonable way we can try to employ to broaden the pool of the the pipe that will be carrying PPPs. Because if we are to try and squeeze, you know, an increased number of PEBs, which now include independents, on the same, you know, SABC pipe, uh, as I've said, we, we may have issues and it, it may even not be surprising, Justice Musenegi, to see the SABC, you know, approach a competent court of law to try and challenge what the castle would be imposing on them. Yes, I understand that. <clears throat> but can I take you to your submissions? I've read very quickly because they came to me after a full, full day of, of listening out. 12.4, 12.3 and 12.4. Could, could you explain it uh, further to me, please? 
I don't know if you have a copy of it here, do you? Um, I'll just give you a copy. We've made out a copy. Um, <clears throat> Thank you. Let's come to say at twelve point three and twelve point four and twelve point five. It really comes down to how do you deal with <coughs> the proportionality <coughs> requirement. It may be, but I just need to know what are the paragraphs. Yes, thank you. I think the spirit of the cited paragraphs talks to one the example I need. You see, the spirit of, 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 of equitability uh, applies to the entire allocation of, of PDPs, starting with the methodology employed in the basic allocation. So, so as 12.3 says that it's unlikely to be achieved in a single program. But it's in a series of problems. So, so it, it, it's just more around combining you know, the spirit of what we are doing in the, in the basic allocations, as well as uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the latter part, where we allocate the number of, of seats you know, proportionally. How, how, do you, how does the proportionality principle work? <coughs> how, how do you divvy out? PEBs on a proportionality basis. What what is the yardstick? The yardstick is the number of of seats currently held. The number of seats currently held, and that's why I cited an example, just by way of an example. Say, as a proportionality principle in the national assembly. The mm. So in local government, how, how would it work? In local government, prior to the time when we had allocated for independence. It, it more or less employed the same principle because we know that uh, in this particular locality, this is the number of of one. But but uh, <coughs> um, let's say let, let's let's take Northwest for a moment. You have local government elections, and you have to issue or allocate PEBs. How would it, in practical terms, be done? Okay, so we would look at uh, in the northwest province the, the, when we talk about the number of. It could be Pumalanga, it could be anywhere yes, else. Yes. I just want to understand how it is done practically. Yes. So, 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 after we have done the basic, we then move into uh, taking current in that current formation. What is the, 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 the layout? What, you know, how many seats does party A have? How many seats does party B have? And, and so, so we use the same. In every municipality in, in, in the province, in the, I'm just trying to understand <clears throat> how do you calculate the proportionality? In the province, in the, in, in, in the district? In the, mm? we, we look at proportionality from a, from a, from a provincial uh, basis. So you'd look at the province and say, DA has. Let's say 190 councillors in in the DA, uh, and then therefore I give them 190 PEBs. I'm just trying to get. You see, there's no trick to this. Let me let me just try and get. We 
we are in a situation where voices have been silenced because gatherings are not possible. One of the issues, some submission of the submission before me has been, that's how we came to this meeting. <clears throat> These parties which say that they don't have digital reach, why don't they use, why don't they use public broadcasters? Why don't they use, in other words, SABC outlet at radio and custom level? So for me, naturally was, well, what is available? How can it be done? And that's why we have this meeting. Is, it, is this a viable recommendation, in short? So how does, so I want to understand just how the basic works and how the proportionality works. In other words, what's the chance of a party really being able to get onto a radio station and pronounce their, their message, however short, however long? Yeah. Because you see, its importance is this. If in fact, this arrangement does not give access to parties, really small ones, then it's an avenue that is not effective and available. Um, <clears throat> if it gives them effective, then the complaint goes away. Or this is, I don't know, any elections in now, because ICASA can help you. You can reach your electorate by relying on the regulations as amended this year. So I'm trying to understand that practically. What would you give each of the parties and how? So, 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 that's the reason. I think why it will be an anonymized bank. I think that's the first point from you know, that we are ourselves are engaging. Mm. Uh, uh, more so that, as I've said, now we are considering the politics. But we, we, we look at the number of seats they currently have on the professional side. Uh, they have previously uh, at, you know, at the local, at the local level. As an aggregate of the province, yes. or aggregate of the district, of the province. But, yes, but there is only so much, and that, that is what the Kasai is able to create. For as long as the pie, which is the SABC, is not expanded, and door to doors are not permitted because of the COVID pandemic, it may be a little bit you know, challenging for, 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 for smaller parties in particular to. to To get the best to get the best out of this particular process because of the way it's currently done. And that is why we then say if a decision is made to consider proceeding, what we may try to do is to invite commercial and other community broadcasters to, to you know, but in a regulated manner, to, to, to take up the PEBs, we will make certain regulatory concessions in consultation. And then we will have, then in that way, but it's not guaranteed. I think it's important that only what's guaranteed is the SAPC can take this charge. You see, <clears throat> um, I was really trying to probe whether this is a viable proposition, and I'm worried that the authority may not be the answer to reaching the masses. Or is it? Justice Mosemeke, the authority. Should a decision be made that elections are proceeding in October, the authority is ready to urgently, through the amendment of the disaster management, Commission, consult community and commercial broadcasters who are ordinarily not that for. Yeah. To consult with them, to entice them, and to encourage them to take PPPs to help broaden this problem. But to answer you more directly, there is a big risk. We, so we cannot come here because the CASA does not broadcast. Mm -hmm. There is a very big risk that if we come here and say, we are going to broaden this pipe and we are going to push more PEBs down the throat of the public broadcaster, uh, it might be commercially no. <clears throat> and it might actually be 
a false promise on our part. Yes, no, no, you should make no promises that you can't, with the law, you can't do lawfully. I'm not asking that. The discretion to use proportionality is your discretion, is it? It's the authority's discretion. Yes, as an, as an instrument of the yeah, the law, the law, the law requires equitable, but but it is it is equitable is what the authority says it's equitable. Now, let me tell you, I'm getting to. There's no trick. There's no. We're on a public platform. We're not trying to look. The point is this: is that everybody has argued and said meetings don't matter. Meetings can't be held, and and people can go to casa and make that point made. Now it appears that that will be quite a difficult proposition. Right? If you cut out proportionality, for instance, in the, all this hearing, I've given everybody 30 minutes, that's it, big and small. If Ikasa did that, how big will your spread be? That's why I'm asking what 12 these means. If you recognize that incumbency already gives people an advantage. If you're an incumbent, you appear on TV every day. Right? An incumbent appears every single day for minutes, for hours, for presentations. In if you are not an incumbent, dololo. <laughs> and now, if, if you, then you get to Ikasa, and Ikasa says, I'm applying proportionality, I'm yet to understand it. Then it means the big girls and boys, I'm going to get the whole big slice and the small. Girls and boys, I'm going to get almost nothing. So I'm trying to probe that and see. I don't say change the law. I don't say change anything. I just want to understand the possibility. When I recommend, I can say, we must go to elections now because you all can address the nation three CASA uh, facility, PEBs. But it appears that actually that may not be possible. All right. First of all, so I, I, will, I, will, I will just pick each and every step, but I think much as we appreciate the 30 minutes each, uh, it's important that the law each of us to have a quick couple representation. So, 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 and not necessarily an equal one. So I understand, yeah, so if we go, go and give everyone 30 minutes, uh, we might also then be challenged on the basis that but the law says it up what? Is equal an instrument of equitable. You but, see, uh, yeah. equitable, doctor, is fair. Yes. Fair. Okay. <clears throat> equal means. Yes. Equitable means. Yes. So it's not the same thing. So even when the law says you do something equitably, you may take all the tall people and make them stand on the flat ground. And all the short people have seen these exercises. And if all the short people stand on a box, then how will we, if you look at them from this side, they are of equal height. When in fact you've helped others to come to that height, okay? So I am really, and I've asked this, for instance, to the presenter from the African National Congress, you know, today, the deputy SG, and I said, should we get an equitable arrangement from ICASA? And this I'll ask to the other parties, but I don't want to make a recommendation that says, you can't complain about lack of access to voters when ICASA is there. That's why I asked you to be here. And I said to her, well, equitable means doesn't mean equal, nor does it mean proportionate. It means fair. And the question becomes, what is fair? And how can we get small parties in local government elections to go and campaign when they can't because the pandemic? No. Pandemic is stopping them yes. from communicating in the ordinary way. How, in other words, what is your new normal? What is ICASA's new normal? Okay. So, 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 so the regulations were, were gazetted in some way in March, not before the end of the day. And, and as I was going through the principles of this basic allocation, which is percentage of slots uh, to be allocated to all political parties and independent countries contesting seats in the municipal elections. This is 60%. Yes. We then have these municipalities, 
which at the, at the 15 percent right and this is made up of percentage of spots to be allocated according to the number of candidates filled there by parties on the district uh, uh, municipalities by parties then we have local municipalities which is another criteria mm -hmm. of allocation, which is the percentage of slots to be allocated according to the number of candidates filled there by parties on the local municipalities which is also 15 percent and then we have the proportional representation there's the number of seats currently held at the district and a local level which is 10 percent so that's where the, at the local government election level the proportional aspect comes to comes to play uh, now the question that we are hearing from just the senate is if we are to do away basically if, if i'm if i'm getting it correct hmm. if we are to do away with all these other criteria as we say we have for an example independence we have 100 independents as an example and we have 50 political parties we treat them as a, in total 150 and we have <coughs> the number of slots available is 3000 i'm making an example so, so so if we are hearing you correctly you are saying if we are to do away with these other criteria and we say we have 150 participants and we have a uh, three thousand or let's say 300 available slots are you going to divide this are you going to give everyone two and walk away if i understood if we do away with all these other principles uh, i think it might be on our side and, and, and a more difficult mm -hmm. approach to justify as the well. Sure. Uh, yeah, I think you must do only what the law. The purpose of this inquiry is not one to change the law. Two is not to require the authority to do anything that is not prescribed in its regulations. You are a statute creature of statute. Okay, so you must act in accordance with the law. So, the purpose of this inquiry is narrow. Will now that parties can go door to door, now that parties can hold rallies now that parties can't can they rely on broadcasting and the answer is yes in a big generic sense in a detailed sense is very little very little just to say like it because yes. of the pie the care is only the public Yes. No, I don't say there's unfairness or anything on the authority. I'm just testing what's the objective outcome of your regulations as you have them now. And it seems to me that when people say, no, let them go to ICASA and, and, and broadcast there, it's not a viable avenue. It's not. Uh, it's not uh, justice beyond what we do. So what we do under normal circumstances, we think it's okay. And yeah. then, and then if, if there, there will be an expectation for additional PEDs and so forth without broadening the you know the pipe, it might be very cumbersome. No, I understand that. And I really haven't invited you to say change the law, yes. break it, do it, do it. I'm really wanting to understand whether this is as many people have submitted to me, let them go to Ikasa. Then you know I, I had to check and see whether it, it can be worked. Obviously, those who have money will go to private broadcasters. There's no, there's no brainer. But those who don't will have to come to you. But as, as I say, we know now that there won't be much um, electioneering because the pipe is small. You put it quite well and, 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 and accept that. If you, is there any closing remarks you want to make? I've had a full day from 9 a.m. and now it's 5 p.m. So I am going to want to come to the end of this, but please do make closing remarks, if any. Um, or correct me wherever I might be in error. No, no. But I will study this quite carefully and closely. And I've got the regulations and the submission. And I understand now that uh, how the process works, and I'm grateful for that. I did not always quite understand it, now I do. And, and the limitations, as well as the strength of the process.
but I turn it over to you. If you have any closing remarks you might want to make. No, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Justice Minister. I thank all the others for being with Casa. We are also grateful of this opportunity to just come and explain our processes. Oh, yes. In the most practical manner possible. We hope to be of help to you. Uh, oh, yes. Well, as you call it, this very complex uh, process. But, uh, I, I don't wish to be you, but well, it's fine by you and Yes. Let me leave you with uh, a parting shot, which might put a smile on your face. When I let me try it. I got phoned offline by somebody who referred me to the what Singapore did now with the elections just before, during the pandemic. <clears throat> they knew that nobody could go out there and canvass, and they allowed every party, every candidate. And one shot of three minutes, five minutes, or seven minutes, whatever it is, whatever you might choose, to say your bit. So every evening they would have that number of candidates who would come and say, and I can better your life. I'm your kind, you know. I can And they that's how they ran the process by small slots. You have and you can if you have money, you can repeat it on YouTube if you want to put it on YouTube. So people can go and look at you again. But they used that and discarded the idea of, of gatherings completely. So everybody came there and you say your bit. And and so for those two weeks, three weeks, they would have a dedicated like station, like the parliamentary channel, which doesn't seem to be very busy now, like a parliamentary channel. Then you dedicate it to politicians coming there and saying whatever they want to say. And they get three, four minutes. Is that possible under your legislation? No. Well, there might be areas. I think, for example, uh, the parliamentary channel is carried by a paid for DSTV, which is a, a, a paid a broadcast, a subscription broadcaster. So it means it's not accessible to, to everyone as a start. Uh, as it is one and two are available on a free to air basis, which therefore means the bulk of, you know, of our population have access to it. But then let's just ask ourselves if we are to create such a provision. Uh, uh, what is it that can be brought to the fore from a, you know, a, because remember, we, since we don't uh, regulate for market failure, we also deal with the situation where we impose a subset liquidity. So let's say we see one and two create that you know, Singapore model. Uh, they will do it, they have the, the means, but now, uh, what are we going to do? Three weeks, Ra. Three weeks. And allow people to convey their message. Three weeks. And then they have 11 months, one week to make money. <laughs> okay? That might be, let me leave you with that thought anyway. And that might be new normal. That might be new normal. People can't come together. So how, how, do you, how do you communicate with each other? I don't say you must do it. I just thought I'd put a smile on your face to say other people have thought about the problem and thought, okay, let's create a temporary dedicated channel. How about are you going to open up or and then they can advertise that I'll be here, I'll be speaking at seven o'clock, I'll speak at nine o'clock, whatever. And why they're going to tweet or they're going to do whatever and tell people I'm speaking at this time. So, but that don't make that your problem. I was just checking whether this is a viable medium we can use. And it looks like at this stage there are several challenges. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Bye bye.